Hey folks, welcome to another top 10 list from the Broken Meeple. I'm Luke Hector, and if you like what you see, please remember, thumb up the video, consider subscribing to the Patreon or the channel itself, but most of all, leave a comment, talk about the games that I'm talking about here, or about the video in question, or you know what, just say hi and give me a hug, I'll take anything. We'll get on with the top 10 list in just a moment, but first, a quick word from my sponsor. As a fellow gamer, you'll understand this is unacceptable. The solution? Head down to my new sponsor, Kiender.co.uk. Kiender stocks many of the hot new releases as well as some old hidden gems. Free delivery on orders over £30, further discounts on bulk purchases, and even 5% of your spending refunded back to you as points to be used for further discounts down the line. If you use the referral link in the description below and sign up for a new account, you'll get 5% discount on your first order over £60. So let's make gaps in your collection a thing of the past. Get down to Kiender and start saving today. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the video. Get on with it. So recently you hopefully would have checked out a long stream that I did with Ninja Geek Games, Mark Monk, where we talked about our best games we can think of and we've got six players, six players, and we don't want to resort to social deduction and party games. Now, with a six player setup though, you have the opportunity to go, oh, let's split it into two groups of three, and then everything's hunky-dory. Here's where it gets a bit more tricky though. Five players. The dreaded five player count. You can't split a three and a two as easily, particularly in my case when I do game clubs, because then you're basically saying, right, well us three have a cool game together, you two sit over in the corner. That doesn't really sit well as a club member, you gotta admit. Not to mention, if I'm gonna play a two player game, I'd rather just go around someone's house rather than go to a game club to specifically play only a two player game. I'm there to interact with people, you know, more than just one other person. But then, so you're stuck with five, and then you find a feel, well, maybe we will get a party game or a social deduction game. Well, there are some, but then you kind of think, I want more players to work. So five just sits in this, this thin little line here between great and great for different reasons, and it's irritating. Because there's not a lot of games I can think of that work great with five players. In fact, you, it's practically a meme at this point where you'll hear me rant about a Kickstarter that basically likes to, or an expansion that says, Oh, we've added in a new fifth player expansion. No! Although on the plus side, I do get to use this quality meme. Five is right out. But of course, there are some people out there who do like to play a five-player game and certainly have asked me, you know, come on, there's got to be some five-player games you can think of. Some Euro, some light games, some different games that aren't just social deduction and party games. There's got to be something, right, Luke? Well, it wasn't the easiest list to put together, but I do have a list of ten and a couple of honourable mentions for you. So without further ado, let's crack on with the top ten five-player games. Get on with it. My number 10, I'm not even certain I can remember when I put this on the top 10 ever, or when you've ever heard me talk about this game. That's because this game kind of sits on my shelf as a, I do want to bring it out every now and again, but when I do bring it out, I'm thinking, oh, it does actually work quite well with five, the turns are pretty quick, why not? And you never would have thought I would enjoy this game, but it's Airlines Europe. Airlines Europe is this kind of ticket to ride clone with a little bit of stock share investment. And you're probably thinking, well, hang on a minute, Luke, you hate this stuff. You hate stock investment sharing. Well, more on that a bit later. But this one is more about a ticket to ride style game, really. And it's more set collection rather than stock investment. Basically, you have a map with different route paths throughout most of Europe. And the idea is, is that in ticket to ride style, you are connecting up those routes with planes as part of these different airline companies. But as you start connecting up these routes, the airline companies start increasing in value and over the course of the game you will be able to acquire and discard the shares for those respective companies in the aim of earning the most money by the time you finish. It's a relatively simple game for what could have been a really complex affair. It's fairly old, I forget when this came out, but I'm probably thinking early 2000s, I don't know, I'll put that up on screen. But this is an interesting little game for me. It doesn't really change that much dramatically between, say, three, four, and five players, apart from how many companies are in the game. I think just having a whole smorgasbord of all the companies and having the interaction with five players and manipulating the companies and the routes is, not to mention a bit more contention on that map for space, I think works pretty well at five. And so if I do put this in the game bag for a night, I'm glad it's there as my cover for when five turn up. For my number nine, this is, how do I describe this one? Quirky, unique, weird, 
esoteric? I don't know. It is a strange little game, and I would have probably passed it right on by if I saw the cover or just basically heard the name. It's pretty generic. But Shamans is a bit of a surprise hit for me, actually. Now, I said I was going to try and buy away from social deduction games, but this isn't quite your typical social deduction fare. The idea is, is that everybody is clamoring to be the first to get to eight points. So there is only one winner in this game. Normally in a social deduction game, it's team versus team. Or you have like different roles, maybe, like something like Werewolf. But here, the idea is, is that you have multiple rounds where players will score points depending on which team they're on and whether they win or lose or collect certain artifacts during the game. You have shamans versus shadow players. And the idea is there's this little counter that ticks over to the moon part of the board. And if it gets there, the shadows win and score some points. If the shamans manage to eliminate the shadows or draw out the game length, then the shamans win. And then you reset the round, deal out the roll cards again, deal out all the trick cards again, and then repeat. But the idea is, is that your teams are changing every round, and because there's artifacts that you can grab for some extra points and maybe the odd power to trigger for points, yes, you are technically on teams, but everybody's got their own little selfish agenda as to what they want to do. The way the trick-taking part works is that you've got a bunch of different suits, each with a special power, and they're numbered 1 to 6 or 1 to 8 in 5 players. The idea is, is that people play a trick and you can lead if you want, sorry, you can follow the lead if you want, but if you don't, the counter ticks more to the shadow side. So you're kind of thinking, well, if I didn't follow suit, if they didn't follow suit, did they do it because they're a shadow player or did they legitimately run out of greens? But whoever plays the lowest and highest in the round, in the particular trick, the lowest gets an artifact with some cool ability, the ability to eliminate players or potentially more points, hello, selfish nature here, or if the highest player plays it or plays out of suit, you may trigger the power of the respective colour if they've all been played. But of course, people are quite selfish and like to hang on to cards, hoping they're the ones to trigger those powers every now and again. It's a really odd little game, but at five players, I think it sings the best. It can work at three and four, but when you get to five players, not only do you have more cards in each suit, which does elongate the game a little bit, that's that slight downside, but you have two shadow players, three shamans. Four players, you only have one shadow player, and obviously with three players, you only have two shamans and one shadow player. I think having the second shadow player in a group of five is just that little bit more of an interesting dynamic. And the game doesn't take that much drastically long with the extra player, but this is a weird one. Shamans. The most generic title in the world. And it doesn't even really have much to do with shamans. It's just got some cool looking sort of graphic artwork on the cards and is a relatively simple rule set. But yeah, it's really different. Much like the crew surprise. What's the crew? Down there. Much that surprised me with its innovative new take on trick taking. This one has also surprised me with its innovative take on trick taking. And I think it's a solid little game that people need to give a look if you're a fan of the genre. My number eight, we mentioned with Airlines Europe that I don't tend to go for stock market games. With some exceptions. I mean, Airlines Europe is mostly about set collection. In Whistlestop, for example, that's not my choice here, you have the shares that you collect, but again, that's mainly set collection. This one is technically a stock market game, but not to the levels of, you know, those complex ones where it's all ah, maths and dividends and all this craziness. No, this is a light little stock game called Stockpile. I don't think any of us expected him to say that. It's more of a trading game. The idea is, is that you have these different share companies with different behaviors for their respective shares of what the share price is. Players will play cards into these different columns in order to place the different share, like the different company shares and maybe some other little perks and bonuses in them to make them either more lucrative or the opposite of that in fact. And then players bid for which column of cards they're going to take based on how much money they're willing to spend. But then the idea is, is that everybody has a little bit of secret information at the start of a round, which is how the share price is going to fluctuate, positive or negative. So you will put a bunch of cards out in one column knowing that they're going to be worth quite a bit. But then the other players, have they sussed this out as well? You know, somebody's trying to go goad you into a bunch of greens and that, or like they're trying to decide whether the greens are worth picking up. Well, you know the greens are about to tank in the next bit, so uh, you know to avoid those. But you don't want to give away that the greens are going to be useless, do you? Because you want everybody else to fall for it. It's a cool little game where it's not so much a social deduction affair, it's just more that I know something you don't, and so that's going to influence what I do for these actions. With five players though, the game really doesn't take much longer. It's a pretty like linear path in terms of how long the game will take. 
but five players, you've got kind of you've got more columns, you've got more cards coming out, and of course the bidding for those columns gets vicious at this level, <laughs> like damn right vicious. It gets expensive quick to bid on those columns if people start outbidding you out. And whenever you get outbidded, you then have to move to a different spot, which might outbid someone else and they have to move to a different spot. So it turns the bidding phase into a chaotic nightmare, but in a good way. And just having all the different ways that those share prices can fluctuate, you know, having five players with that little bit of information, it's a cool little game. It's still on my, yep, yeah, right on the bottom of there. I really enjoy it. The expansions are hit and miss. It, they add a little bit more complication to the game in places, and I don't think the game needs it. I think the game is great as a simple affair. But yeah, maybe a theme I can't stand, but I just think this one works really well and definitely is one to consider for five players. For my number seven, we're going to go to something a little bit bigger now, a big box strategy Euro game. Yeah, you might think, oh, come on, Lou, you're getting away with light games at the moment. Where's my big epic game? Well, epic is a, I don't know if epic's the word I would use, but it's certainly a big enough Euro. And it's one of my favorite Euros. It was in my top 10 for a long time. It has dropped the bit and maybe cooled on it slightly, but not to the point where I dislike it. It's still probably in my top 30 easily. And that is one of Stonemaier's better games, Scythe. Scythe with five players, particularly bearing in mind that you may not necessarily have the invaders from a fire expansion, which takes up to seven, five is how many players you could play the base game with. And if people know what they're doing, Scythe doesn't take that much longer with five players. Granted, five players, all of which are new, ugh, it's going to be a bit of a longer affair, which is why this doesn't go further up the list. But five players with people who have got some idea of what they're doing or are quick to pick up these engine builders, it can go at a pretty decent pace and five players means that every faction is represented from the base game that is. Even if you throw in invaders from afar though, you could pretty much still play with those five original factions or to be honest, five out of seven is still pretty decent actually. But it kind of just ensures that all bases are covered, there's no like big gap in the area where nobody goes and it just flows at a decent rate and again doesn't outstay its welcome too much providing it's not a teaching game that's my one caveat with this entry teaching this to brand new players four new players with five of you there whew, this could drag on a little bit long but nah uh, you know get a decent group together five of you scythe does pretty well certainly a lot better than viticulture or wingspan will which are my other two favorite stonemaier games yeah do not play those games with more than well, frankly, I wouldn't want to play those games with more than four for Viticulture and not really more than three for Wingspan. Five player Wingspan? I could not... I, literally, I will grow wings and fly away faster than you can try and get me into a five player Wingspan game. That's just insanity. Take it easy. Calm I can't down. do this! I promise you, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> For my number six, this one is a nice, light-ish <laughs> deduction game. And I say light-ish because, yes, the rules are light, but your brain is going to implode after playing this, like with most deduction games, but particularly when you got five of you in this. The game doesn't really take any longer with five, at least not to a great extent, maybe, say, another five, ten minutes max, but there's a lot to think about when you get them down, and the rules are pretty easy to teach. And yeah, you may think, well, hang on a minute, the turns don't go around as quick, but then you're always thinking about what's on the table. Whether you get a turn is kind of irrelevant in Cryptid. Cryptid is a great little deduction game, abstract as all get out, the fact that you're finding a monster, whatever. There's basically one point on this grid of hexes that's been mathematically designed that, that only one of these hexes can possibly have the monster based on five clues, well, based on a clue that each player reads in the game. If you have three, four, or five players, literally all that changes is the like layout of the map slightly, but mainly just what clues you read. That's it, just the clues. So if you've got three clues, you've only really got to think about two other people's worth of answers, and that's not as good. I don't tend to bring Cryptid out with less players. With five of you, though, you've got to figure out four other clues on top of your own before you can deduce where that monster is, and I think that's just a good level of thinkiness. You're looking at all these different cubes and discs everywhere, trying to think, well, yours is that, but then if yours is that, that contradicts that, and ah, and the brain power required goes up to a decent level. Uh, the fact that, as I mentioned, turns don't go around as quick, 
but then it doesn't matter because yes, okay, I've got to wait for four other people to go before I get to ask a specific question, but everybody else is asking questions. Information is going onto the table, which means you've always got something new to think about. So you never really feel like you're stuck in a mode of downtime with this. It's just easy to get out in about 30 to 45 minutes. Everybody's got their brains switched on. You're going to need it with this game. But yeah, it's pretty easy to say that if I've got four or particularly five players, I'm definitely down for a bit of cryptid. As we get on to the top half of my number five, the strangest thing is that I swear that most of these games that I like are all on the bottom shelf of this Kallax thing that you don't see in the picture because one was over there, one's down there, and this one's literally the game above it. But it must be the five player row apparently on this uh, 4x4 shelf. I don't know, work that one out. But this one is uh, one of probably my favorite game that uh, was it Alexander Pfister has been involved with. I think he co-designed this one. And yes, I know that's sacrilege to some people, but you know, I just don't go for his game, so sue me. I'll give you a piece of <laughs> But this one was an older design called Broom Service. Uh, who, who on earth designed this with him? It was a, uh, ooh, Andreas Pelican, I believe. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that right. But co-designed with Alexander Pfister. This is a really cool, pretty simple game of role selection where you're all witches moving across this map and trying to deliver different color potions to different towers for victory points. Pretty straightforward affair. You play so many rounds, there's an event each round. That all sounds pretty simple, right? Ho 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 we uh, you want to break up a few friendships every now and again? This is pretty good for you. What happens is that you have a selection of role characters that you can pick, kind of like, well, don't want to spoil, but you've got a bunch of different roles that you will select from each round. I forget how many you select, I think it's uh, five or six, I can't remember, but you select a number of these roles each round in secret. And the idea is, is that person leading the round will say, I am the herb grower. I don't know, we'll say the herb grower. I know for Americans that's kind of weird because you don't pronounce your H's, but still, herb grower. And you say herbs, and we say herbs, because there's a f***ing H in it. <laughs> you say I'm a herb grower, and you can say you're the brave or the, like, the cowardly one. If you're the cowardly one, you just take a small reward and go with it. Like, I really need this, I'll take the cowardly version. But if you think that you're the only person in the in the group that's played that particular role, you can say I'm the brave herb grower and then you'll get a bigger reward. Problem is, after saying brave, you then have to go clockwise around the table and hope that no one else has that card. Because if someone does and they play it, they can say they're the brave herb grower and then they get the bonus and you get diddly squat. With five players, not only does the game go on at a decent pace regardless, but you don't have this bewitched rule, which means that certain roles are kind of left out on the side and you lose a couple of victory points for taking them in the round. I don't find many people take bewitched roles anyway, and I just like the idea of having all the roles in the, in the game each round. But five of you with that brave rule? This destroys friendships if you're not careful. I mean, the amount of cursing that goes around this table, as somebody will say, I am the brave weather witch. No, good, 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 ah! As somebody flips out that weather witch and just delights in the fact that you get diddly squat and it's like, look with me, I get to do all this cool stuff. It's like, I'm gonna kill you. It's like, it really can get pretty vicious. But again, in a fun, jovial way, because it's a light game, it's not heavy. The game's only, what, like 60 to 90 minutes, absolute tops. It's it's just a cool role selection game. But yeah, works pretty well at five. It just, it means that you don't have to teach this whole rule. Not that Bewitched rule is that complicated, but again, just one less thing to teach. We can just get on with the game, nice and simple. If only the resolutions of each round were nice and as light as that. And for all the Euro fans out there, don't worry, we are now up to another Euro game. However, this will be the last Euro game on the list. Yes, the top three are not Euro games, but this is probably, I think, hands down my favorite worker placement game there is right now. With the new expansion that's just come out, it's elevated it even more, particularly as I can play it solo. But we're not talking about solo, we're talking about five players. And I'm surprised to say that Architects of the West Kingdom, which is downstairs in my game bag at the moment, 
really does work well at five. Now, some people ask me whether this would have gone on my six player list, because if you have the expansion or Age of Artisans, you put the orange player in, then you can have six. I have played it at six. It works fine at six, but six mainly just makes a five player game that little bit longer and I don't, I, I will play it with six, but I certainly don't seek it out as my first choice for a six player game. But five, people want to play a worker placement game at five. A lot of worker placement games go on way too long. You know, they can be tight as nails with the placements, fine, but it's just like, oh my God, how long is this game gonna take? Architects of the West Kingdom doesn't fall for that though. You have quick start rules that allow you to get an apprentice at the start of the game. That speeds things up considerably. But the turns are pretty quick. I mean, if I go to the quarry, I get a stone. I'll go there again, I get two stone. Once people start getting into the swing of the rules after the teach, the actions are still pretty quick. The longest action you have really is building something and even that doesn't take that long. Maybe the black market reset, but again, that usually involves multiple players. And with the town center, with five of you dotted around all over the place with all your color meeples, not only does the game look really cool on the table, but you've got five people to choose from with the town center. People are getting their meeples like lifted up from every way, which way but loose. It can get pretty vicious with that. But yeah, the game can still go at a good pace. I have played a five, six player game of Architects of the West Kingdom in both cases in 90 minutes before. It doesn't take too long. Longest I think I've had is two hours. And two hours might be a bit long for Architects of the West Kingdom, but considering what, you know, considering five players is normally like a killer for anything Euro related. Does anybody play five tribes with five players? Seriously, try that one out for size. But. I think Architects works quite well. Just use the quick start rules. The turns are quick. You know, people that are fairly used to Euro games, preferably I wouldn't teach this to brand new gamers at all, especially not if you're gonna throw in the expansions, which ideally I think with five you probably do want to do. But yeah, this is hands down I think the first worker placement game that I even think of before I, when I think, all right, people want a Euro game for five players. Ooh, Architects is about, mm, we'll use that really does the job nicely. So now, solo, two, three, four, and five. I enjoy the game at all accounts, though maybe less with two. But as I say, works pretty well at five. My number three, I could play with four players, and four players is nice for this, but I find that six players, as some people ask me about, this game just elongates a little bit too long. Five, I think, is a good sweet spot from the number of roles that are present and also how long the game takes, which is one of my favorite, if not, I think, possibly the my favorite role selection game ever, Citadels, the great classic from 2000, although I have the new 2016 master set, which looks a lot better. But five player Citadels gives you a decent amount of roles that are in each round. It adds just that little bit of extra, like, toughness for the assassin and the thief to be able to pick who they want. But the game doesn't take that much longer with five compared to four, especially now that you play only to seven buildings instead of eight. And if you do think the game takes a little bit long still, you could just literally go down one building. It wouldn't make too much of a difference. But five is an easy group to teach Citadels too, because the rules are not complicated. People get to grips with it all right. The one thing that usually makes me hesitate to go any more than five players though, is the time it takes to get through that drafting phase. There are some people who, like me, can look at the roll of cards and go, yep, I want that roll. You know, like I already know two or three rolls I want, and if they're all there, I'll pick one and get on with it. Whereas there are some people who can look at a selection of roles and find king, queen, and literally take about 20 hours to think about which role they want to do. It's like, hurry up! Granted, they can elongate the game a bit. But, nah, honestly, I think five's pretty good. When you get to four and three, I mean, two and three player, I actually enjoy with Citadels. You use two roles at a time. Four players, I like Citadels with four, and I will still happily play it at four. But you do get a lot of face-up roles turn up at the thing. And I think having the face-up roles kind of like reduces that decision making of oh which roles are in this round or so you really want more face down roles than you want the face up ones and five is just that good little sweet spot there right in the middle where it's like there's enough roles that are not revealed to you but then there's enough roles in the round to actually have a decent selection and of course not have the game way outstay its welcome which i think it tends to do when you've got six or more why you would play this with, si with more than six i have no idea but i don't know there are some crazy people out there Rubble, 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 rubble.
And continuing my trend of sticking with the bottom shelf of this Kallax. Seriously, what is it with this Kallax bro and all the five player games that I'm voting on here? This is my racing game of choice with five. When I was doing my six player list, my number well, I don't want to say which one number is quite. Almost did that. Whew, that was close. Nearly spoiler alert. But, well, I'll spoil a little bit. Downforce was on my list for, no, for the six player games. Downforce is a fantastic game for racing with six players. Works fine at five, but if I've got five players specifically, I'm thinking, well, we can put Downforce away for a bit, and instead I bring out Snow Tails, the dog sledding racing game where you've got your sort of pre built track and you're on dog sleds racing from one end to the other, past trees and around massive corners and across cliff edges and stuff, in order to get to the finish line. Nice and simple. It uses a very basic car mechanic of using your two dogs and the brakes and you play, uh, I think you play a minimum one but up to three cards in a round and you replace the cards and you basically add the two dogs together speed wise, take off the brakes and that's your total speed and that's how far you move. But the fun thing with this is that you drift to the side if your two dogs aren't aligned. So if one is faster than the other, you start drifting in that direction and vice versa. That's when, especially going around corners, it gets hilarious. With five players, the turns are still pretty quick. I mean, you've just, you've got plenty of time to think about what you're gonna do with your numbers before it's your turn. So you've got no reason to AP at this point. And then your turn is literally play the numbers, work out the speed and go not too difficult but five of you on that track gets pretty cool gets pretty contested after a while because you're gonna have some corners where you really want to make a certain line and somebody gets in your way and it's like Arr! it just it just does well you can play this with less players fine but I just think it doesn't make the game stupidly long with five it's a nice like almost like claustrophobic environment with everybody trying to get past each other the turn order becomes you know vastly important because you think well you're going to go before me so you're going to get out of my way before i go around that's not too bad and then somebody comes in and cuts you off it's like Ugh! it it's a really good wild ride snow tails is still one of my favorite racing games such a cool theme i love husky dogs they're so adorable but yeah, I'd love to go dog sledding at some point actually i've never done it before but i'd definitely jump at the chance but for now there's always snow tails And for my number one, of course, I mean, this this one had to be obvious for some players. It's in my collection. It's in the top 50 games I have, although it's cooling a little bit, mainly just because I've bloated it too much. But some people will want to get as many players as they can for this game because it is negotiation. So you think, all right, I need lots of players. I think when you get too many players in this game, though, it does bloat it and make it a little bit uncontrollable. But suffice to say, you can't really go less than five because there's just not enough different people in the game. Five is the maximum that the base game allowed, and I think that is still hands down the best player count to play Cosmic Encounter. Cosmic Encounter, where everybody has an alien power that breaks the game system in some way, we're all vying for planets, and it's just a case of, right, I'm going to attack red this turn. Uh, who wants to be on my side? Anybody? Come on, one then, come one all. And the defender's doing the same thing, and everyone's shouting at each other, while everybody's got these stupid alien powers that are hilarious. I mean, one's like the parasite, who is like, oh yeah, you, you can't come with me on this mission. Uh, well, I'm the parasite, so guess what, boy? You know, I'm coming, I'm coming with you anyway. And there's, there's like a bride one in the recent set that has you marrying off to other agents. It's really weird. Lure used to be so tender. Oh, I only wrote that poem to test my printer. That's the great thing about Cosmic Encounter. It's just zany negotiating fun. Five players just gives that right sweet spot of not being too bloated, but having enough people to actually negotiate with. The other factor though, is that bearing in mind, you only have one person versus one person. So one on one. If you have an even number of players, there's a chance for the teams to just be even. So three versus three, two versus two. Now that can still happen with odd players if somebody abstains, but what tends to happen is that there's an uneven element. With five, there could be a side with three and a side with two, or even more weird stuff, depending again if people abstain. So I think getting rid of that possibility or easy possibility of having even teams just elevates that game just a little bit more. It's like little quirks like that that five players does for this one. But yeah, it's a negotiation game. It's crazy fun. Granted, I think I've bloated my copy too much. I'm actually tempted to actually scrap some of the content I've got or seal it away and never use it again because 
it just got to a point where I think it's ridiculous. I mean, they're still bringing out aliens for this, and it's just like, seriously, Cosmic Encounter does not need this. In fact, stop bringing out more aliens. Why don't you give us a big box to make it easier to store the wretched thing? That'd be nice, fantasy flight. <laughs> Get a job! But it's zany aliens and craziness and negotiation and that. I mean, this game just works sound with five. It was definitely a toss up with this and my number two and three. It's like, well, which one is going to take the top spot? But then I thought, yeah, this one just pretty much shines at that five player count. And so if I've got the box and I'm willing to get it all out, definitely this one is a great laugh at conventions or on game nights because it doesn't take too long to resolve either. It's a solid one. Cosmic and Gary. So there you go, there's my top 10 five player games and seriously there were not many others to choose from. I've only got four others I had on the list. I considered Sheriff of Nottingham. Sheriff of Nottingham is fun, but the problem is is that with five players the rounds take longer and not to mention you play more of them. With three players you play the Sheriff three times, so you play nine rounds. Four players you play it twice, so you only play eight rounds. And five players you still go through twice, so you play ten rounds. So it's nine, eight, 10. It's a weird sort of a like switch over how long the game takes. So Sheriff of Nottingham is really my four player game of choice. Sometimes free, but nah, I never really want to play Sheriff of Five. It's just too long. Uh, Court of Miracles would probably be my number 11. This is an underrated game from Lucky Duck Games, which again is down there. Seriously, what is it with the shelf? But it pretty much is only played at five. I mean, you can play it with less players, but this is an area control game with some hidden information, a little bit bluffing. And it's like, it's such a simple little game. I've cooled on it a little bit since my review, but I still enjoy it. It's still in my collection. And I will pretty much only bring it out with five players. It's just that maybe I've just cooled a little bit. I mean, it literally is my number 11. I was so like, ah, oh, this one on Airlines Europe. And I just thought, probably Airlines Europe, I enjoy just that little bit more. But that's, you know, that being said, the Court of Miracles is still one to have a look out for. Uh, another one was Takedo, because Takedo really is just a zen-like game. The turns aren't particularly long, and I think five players is pretty good, not to mention it makes it really contested for those spaces. It's just nice and smooth. It'd be in my teens, just not quite top 10 material. And then there was one more. Where's that other one? Ah, yes, the new Flippin' Right game, Get On Board, that I reviewed back in April. Well, that works all right with five as well, because you're really contested on that map as you're trying to, uh, like, design your bus plan, you know, to go on certain routes and they want getting in your way and causing traffic. The downside with why this wouldn't make my top 10 though is because even though you are on this communal board, it does elongate the game a bit because you don't have less rounds. You're doing it in turn order still. So if you've got five of you, that takes longer than a four, which takes longer than a three. It gets to a point where I'm thinking, hmm, for a flip and right, maybe this game is dragging on a little bit too long with five. Not always, but certainly not enough. You know, it's, it's too much of a variation to put it in my top 10. And that was literally it. Yes, I know there are games out there where five players shine. I'm sure people who are fans of Quartermaster General are gonna get on my case about that. And granted, that works. Quartermaster General is just not a game I'm that massive a fan of. I mean, I don't mind it, it's okay, but I don't own it. I play it every now and again, like once in a blue moon, but yeah, it wouldn't make my top 10, but I'd be hard pressed to think that it wouldn't end up in the top 10 of many people who are fans of the game. It's just not a player count I'm a fan of. I hate these five player expansions. You know, most games, literally publishers just stick the word five on the box to sell more copies. That is literally the only reason. I've actually heard designers say to me that the only reason it says five players on the box is because the publisher made them do it. They don't even believe themselves for their own game design that the game works with five and they still do it anyway. Publishers, please, Please stop it already. It it. Enough with the five player expansions. Enough with this whole two to five on the box. If you need a variant for two players, it doesn't work at two. If you decide that, oh, it works at five, but we've not actually shortened the game anyway, it's just have another player, it doesn't work at five, okay? And I do not want to see fifth player expansions used as a means of justifying why you've jacked up the stretch goals on a Kickstarter or something. I mean, there are some five player expansions that are ridiculous. I mentioned five tribes earlier. I cannot fathom who would be insane enough to play five tribes at five players. That is insanity. The game takes a long time at four. Can you imagine the amount of AP and downtime in a five player game of five tribes? It's insane. What else have I got here that would work not great with five? Ooh, blimey, uh, 
Sentinels in the Multiverse even, one of my favourite games ever. Even I'm like, yeah, you know what, I don't particularly want to play that with five, that can take a while. Uh, try find Energy Empire could be in my teens actually, Energy Empire could have been in my teens maybe. Uh, on the Underground, could blimey, do not play that with five. I mean, the time that game will take with five is ridiculous, it's just not worth it. Uh, there's definitely going to be some other viral, hmm, viral, it's, can that be played with five? That could have been in my teens as well, I could have considered that. Uh, Alien Frontiers, can it be played with five? No, thank God. Western Legends, <sighs> too long with five, it's just too many people to juggle around. And that's the, just kind of the crux with it. Five usually is just shoved into the game and it just elongates the time. And most games are on that borderline of outstaying their welcome, even at four. Three has always been my sweet spot. Four is decent enough and works well for some games, but when you put in that fifth player, 95% of the time, all you're doing is adding, well, time. And that's just not what I want. I hate waiting. So that's it for me on this episode of The Broken Meeple. If you like what you see, please remember to consider the Patreon, subscribe to the video, like it, thumbs up, all that gubbins, but mainly just leave a comment and let me know about the choices I've made, which five player games do you love? Put them in the comments, but remember, I'm trying to stay away from pure social deduction and pure party games for this. I'm looking for games that don't necessarily fit into those two categories. Until next time, you can check out more content on the channel, including my recent video where I talk about why Catan is not dead. It's still going strong but when I've been talking about five players there's also a six player list that I did with Mark Monk from Ninja Geek Games on a live stream have a listen to that when you've got a chance take care and remember as always regardless of how many players you've got it's still only a game bye for now